So we were looking on, on Tuesday at limits at infinity. And we were looking at the special case of rational functions. And we provided sort of our trick for finding the limit as x goes to infinity of a rational function, which is to divide both the numerator and the denominator by the largest power of x. And we had you do an example in class, and you got two, I think. You got a finite non zero number. Let's look at the other things that could happen. Let's try to find the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared divided, x cubed, sorry, divided by x squared plus one. Let's see if we can determine algebraically what happens as x goes to infinity. I mean, we could obviously go to Desmos and just take a look, but let's see if we can do this algebraically. And we're going to be using here precisely the same trick we used yesterday. All of these are dealt with in the same way. And that trick is to divide top and bottom by the largest power of X that appears. And we see an X cubed and we see an X squared. Let's do so. We divide top and bottom by x cubed. And this, let's see, is going to work out a little differently from what happened yesterday. Once we start to simplify these things, x cubed over x cubed is one in the denominator. I mean, for this trick and just as general mathematical knowledge, you should know that if you have addition in the top, that breaks up. So this addition up here um, is letting us break that fraction up into two. And one of those things cancels. X squared over X cubed is one <coughs> over X. And now something, as I say, different from yesterday happens. Yesterday, we just got a nice number, two, I think it was. Here, both these terms in the denominator are going to zero, and you're getting a division by zero error. And what does that tell you? Well, a division by zero error doesn't have to mean that the limit doesn't exist. If you cast your mind back 
for that factoring and canceling trick we did with rational um, functions. We'd have division by zero errors, and then we'd factor and we'd cancel stuff, and we'd still get a limit. But the key there was that those division by zero errors we were getting with rational functions were of a very specific form. With those rational functions, we were getting zero divided by zero. And if you have a division by zero error that looks like this, the limit can exist. We talked about this yesterday. We said that having a limit where the top is not to zero and the bottom is zero is a determinate form. And the reason we call it determinate is that it allows us to determine the limit, or rather, it allows us to determine that the limit does not exist. So going back so we've skipped a frame going back here. If we get this division by zero error and the top is not zero, the top is one in this case, that tells us that this limit does not exist. A third case, well, does anybody have any questions about this example? Yes. How do they go to zero? Um, because if you have any number divided by X raised to any power, that limit as X goes to infinity is always zero. And that's what we have here, one over X to the first, one over X to the third. One last example. Let's take the limit as X goes to infinity of O X divided by X cubed plus X squared. Where once again, going to attempt this limit finding trick we have three powers here, one, two, and three. And three is the biggest of those powers. So we'll divide by X cubed. And I'm, since we've done this twice, maybe going to move a little faster. Dividing a sum by X cubed is the same as dividing each of the individual terms by X cubed. Um, And what does that give us? That gives us the limit as X goes to infinity of one over X squared, we cancel up here, divided by one, that's this fraction, plus 
one over x. That's this fraction. And as x goes to infinity, the top goes to zero, this goes to zero, and we end up with zero divided by one. And this isn't a problem. I think sometimes this causes confusion to students who maybe if you haven't done sort of algebra in a while, because people know you can't divide by zero and think that means that this should be undefined too. But if you type it into your calculator, zero divided by one is a perfectly nice expression. You get to zero from that. Let's turn the three examples we've looked at into three cases. I mean, this very formal trick with the limit is all very well, but it's going to get pretty tedious if we have to do it repeatedly. And it's not really helping us develop much intuition, perhaps. Remember that a rational function is one polynomial divided by another polynomial. And um, what I'm going to put on the board next will be certainly familiar for some of you because you have seen this precise statement when you learned about horizontal asymptotes. If the degree of the top is bigger than the degree of the bottom, then the limit as x goes to infinity of this rational function does not exist ever. I mean, this trick is showing you why it doesn't exist. If the degree of the top is bigger than the degree of the bottom, and you do this trick, you're always going to wind up with a number divided by zero. Like let's say we had, instead of x cubed, we had x cubed plus x. Then if we followed this along, x cubed plus x divided by x cubed is one divided by x squared. That one divided by x squared would go to zero, and you'd still have one divided by zero. So modifying the top a little didn't really change anything, because the only thing that matters here is the degree, whether the degree is bigger than the degree of this quadratic. I'm going to run out of slides, so that's we need to copy this down. R of x is p of x over q of x. If the degree 
of the top is less than the degree of the bottom, this limit is always going to be a zero. And we saw that before. We saw that in this example, three is bigger than one. So the degree of the bottom is bigger than the degree of the top. And we ended up with a zero as the limit. And again, the details don't matter. It's just a question of degree. Like, what if I put a three up there? Then that three would carry along. I'd end up with three over x squared. That would still go to zero and the problem would shake out in the same way. The case that requires a little more comment. I mean, you can, if you set your mind to it, you could guess what it has to be. We've said what happens if one of the um, degrees is bigger than the other. All that remains is to ask what happens if the degrees are equal. So say the degree of P of X equals the degree of Q of X. And Let's say that's n. Then if you rearrange your term so that your n term is first, you're going to have an x to the n term in the top plus some other stuff. And you're going to have an x to the n term in the bottom plus some other stuff. And the limit exists. And the limit is gotten by dividing these coefficients. So since the example we did of this uh, yesterday is no longer available to us, let's, let's see how this works out. Let's say 2x cubed minus x plus one divided by x squared minus three x cubed. The degree of the top, remember that the degree is the highest term that appears. The degree of the top is three. The degree of the bottom is also three. And if you want this limit, you take the two in front of the x cubed term and you divide it by the negative three in front of the x cubed term to get negative two thirds as your limit. Why does this work? Why does any of this work? <laughs> well, what's going on intuitively 
with all of these where here if the degree of the top is bigger so sorry searching around for examples if the degree of the top is bigger then the top is going to get bigger much much faster than the bottom like if we maybe i'll just pull up my calculator no that's going to take time to load let's do this in desmos and let's look at f of x equals x cubed plus x and g of x equals x squared plus x. So the top is in red, the bottom is in blue. And share this so online students can see it. And you see that the red is bigger than the blue. The numerator is bigger than the denominator. So when you divide these things, you at least get something bigger than one. And what happens as you adjust this zoom, I did not mean to change the x's, it was the y's I was trying to mess with. Let's try this again. As you adjust this zoom, you see that as we go in this direction, the top is getting much, much bigger than the bottom. And if you have a fraction where the top is much, much larger than the bottom, 10 billion divided by five, that's going to be a very large number a large number divided by a small number is still large. So we have this fraction where we have this very, very large number in the top and this much smaller number in the bottom. And that combination causes the fraction to be large. So I didn't write this down. The limit um, doesn't exist. In fact, it's going to either positive or negative infinity. Yeah. And if we reverse those, let's just get back to the whiteboard. If we look at sort of the reverse of that, here, the denominator, because of that x cubed, is getting much, much bigger than the numerator. If you have like a very large denominator compared to the numerator, like 5 divided by 10 billion, that's going to be close to zero. This last case is maybe a little harder to argue for, but the point is that when X is big, this X to the N term on the top and this X to the N term on the bottom are by far and away the most significant terms in the fraction. Like let's say we have a plus five at the end here. If we have like a B of N squared and we compare that to five, the five might as well not be 
there. It's basically irrelevant. So everything except for this is basically irrelevant when x gets big enough. And here the x to the n's cancel, and this fraction is a sub n over b sub n. So when x gets big enough, basically only these leading coefficients matter. That was maybe a little informal, but I hope it got the general idea across. And I've mentioned this several times by now, but if this looks familiar to you, it's because the limit as x goes to infinity of any function equals k if and only if y equals k is a horizontal asymptote. So for maybe the third, and I promise the last time, um, with rational functions in college algebra, for example, I know we teach how to find horizontal asymptotes in high school algebra. Maybe you learn to do that depending on the district. So if all of this stuff with the limits seemed really familiar, it's because it's something you learned about horizontal asymptotes, just rephrased a little. And if it doesn't look familiar, that's fine too. You've seen it now. That brings us, that should bring us to the end of this section. And um, this section is the last section that is on Friday's um, test. I have the quiz due Saturday like normal, but you really want the quiz to be practice for the test. You do not want the test to be practice for the quiz. So I strongly advise you to do this to attempt this quiz as quickly as possible so that there's time before Friday to ask me if you discover you have problems. I mean, I haven't given you any kind of formal test review. I'm telling you now, though, the problems on the test are going to be very similar to the stuff that's been on the quizzes. I don't, I'm not a fan of using tests to throw students curveballs. So if you study this material in the quiz and you can do it, you should be able to do it in the test as well. We still have time. <laughs>